legend icon is Cohen. How are you? Uh, how are you doing <laughs> this whole thing? Uh, Man, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing good, and it's an honor to be talking to you today, bro. Chill, bro, chill. <laughs> um, what, what's your new norm, first off, right now, with everything that's going on? I've been getting that question just about every day, and um, uh, the, the, the deep answer is worship is my new norm. And, it, and I used to think that it was, but I think a lot of times we've associated singing with worship. And it's not. It's this whole idea of like really, really living in the presence of God. Yeah. And all distractions, almost all distractions just stripped away, man. You know, it's not just like, let me run in, the, let me jump in the car and go down to my favorite coffee shop now. No, it's not that. Now you have like legit quiet time, <laughs> legit chill time, meditation wow. time, whatever it is. And um, so my new normal is really just staying staying in the presence of God and realizing you can live there 24 seven. And it's, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if my, my, my opinion is popular on this, but man, I'm really loving the reset of this whole thing. I'm, I'm loving it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I have, I know other people who are like losing their minds right now, but like, for sure. I feel like it was a forced Zen retreat for me, man. And yeah. so I'm, I'm embracing it wholeheartedly and listening to what God is saying. That said, my new normal is waking up in the morning. The practical side is waking up in the morning, you know, spending time with, with Adrian. We, we have kind of these guided prayers we do in the morning and these kind oh. of meditations and stuff and oh. just getting in the word and then, you know, watching, you know, whatever we're going to watch. We cook together a lot more now. You know, our, our yeah. schedules are so aligned now. So we like been cooking together and dreaming together and starting new businesses and all that kind of stuff, you know, nice. in the last economic downturn, some of the biggest businesses that we know today were created during 2008, 2009. Wow. Some of the biggest billionaires of all time were created during the great depression. So I'm, I'm using this to, to get creative as well. I see you bro. So you going to be the next billionaire, man. I mean, I'm already a billionaire, so I'm, I'm going for a trillionaire status. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Bro, I've been cooking too. So like, yeah. I just bought a grill. I didn't know nice. I'm be a professional steak cooker. So now my wife is like constantly asking me like, do the grill with the steak. And yesterday I did pork chops. Nice. So, you know, the boy doing his thing. <laughs> Bro, I wanted to ask you. So obviously we're here. Uh, I have an album coming out, Heathen. Just that word heathen, right? What does it mean to you? Uh, growing up, did you hear it? Uh, what did it mean, like, in context? Like, do you have any stories with that word? I mean, I grew up in a pretty heavy-handed, legalistic, you okay. know, ultra, uh, you know, discipleship type of movement, you know. And it was, you know, a lot of church planting and stuff like that. But it was really... There was a lot of control. There was a lot of manipulation and that sort of thing. Mm. So I heard the word heathen a lot as it related to other people because we, you know, we almost grew up in that we're elite. We're the only ones that have the truth and everybody else is wrong. And, you know, I must have heard a million sermons about what is wrong with other other Christians. And that kind of stuff just drove yeah. me crazy. Yeah. So anytime I heard the word heathen, obviously, it was in a negative context about someone else. It was such a self-righteous you know, yeah. comment regarding yeah. other people. I'm like, eh, you know, and then right. you get, you get over that, you know, uh, years later and realize maybe we were the heathens the whole time. Maybe we were the ones that just were, were, were yeah. so, so insensitive to what was going on and so tone deaf to what was going on in our world that, that we sort of stayed in a cave and said, we're the only ones that have the truth. And it's like yeah. horrible, man. Yeah. I remember growing up, like if, if you said, Ah oh, man, I've missed church for a month now, yo. I must so be a heathen, like, yeah. <laughs> heathen, right? So there was like yeah. a playfulness with it, like a joke. But then there was also like the serious side where I remember uh, in youth group, a kid had messed up, slept around with some girls by accident. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the four years of high school, he was labeled like the heathen. Like, watch out yeah. for Peter. I'm making up a name right He's now. Yeah. Watch out for Peter. 
you know, he can't be hanging around with these girls or I wouldn't, I don't want you hanging out with him because he's bad influence. Yeah. But, How does somebody sleep around on accident though? I'm just trying to understand. <laughs> that, hey, that's his words. That's his words. You know, I'm not. It was you know, an accident. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I love it. I love but, it. Yeah. It's like either you could become that label or yeah. growing up, it's a playful thing where you just throw around that word, right? Yeah, yeah. And as I was thinking more about that word, I really like how bold it was. Um, I really like how it causes a lot of conversations. Sure, sure. Uh, I think you've seen some of them on my IG in the comments. Yeah. And man, I really wanted to hear your heart. Uh, one, a little bit of history about you. Starting off, Israel, one of the greatest iconic legends in our Christian music industry, or just music industry as a whole, right? Um, Thank you for that. I am, I am navigating right now, and I, I want to get, I see you like big, big OG, big uncle right now, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I need some, some knowledge from you, and I'm hoping <laughs> you can to me, like, just navigating through this. Uh, of course, my heart at, at the beginning, when I lay, named this album Heathen, I had a lot of like, man, this is going to be great. The message of God is going to really pierce through the world. And uh -huh. um, this is for everyone, whether you're called a heathen or you're not a heathen, but you're being called a heathen. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of boxes when it comes to Christian culture. Mm -hmm. And um, have you ever felt uh, in a box in your, in your career as an artist? How did you navigate through that? If you didn't, uh, I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm I mean, I, I'm going to answer that in a second, but like what made you name the album Heathen and why? Do you have kind of the elevator pitch of that? I do. So I named this album Heathen, right? I'm digging, as I'm creating this album, I really wanted to make something that was very true to myself. So my first album was called We Belong. And that first album that I did was very much great music. I love it till this day, right? I'm not going to bash this album. But it was very much my first time ever being an artist, first time with a record label saying, hey, this is what it's like to do this and that. So I'm trying to please everyone. I want to please yeah. radio. I want to please youth groups. I want to please... Mm. My mom, I want to please everyone. So sure, I'm sure. very good, safe music for everyone. And as I get to travel, I'm doing all these tours and stuff like that. Uh, I get to see a lot of what green rooms start to look like, right? <laughs> uh, I get to see just concerts and stuff like that. And I'm yeah. like, one, this is awesome. But two, I'm like, oh, I didn't know it was like this, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so then I make this rebellious album called Panorama. That's my second album. And I'm like, I'm going to give you guys a full view of who I am. I am not a perfect human being. I feel like everyone's trying to be perfect as a Christian. I'm not a pastor. I'm not uh, 10 years in Bible college. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm a person that loves Jesus so much. I'm on this journey, and this is my story I want to share with you guys, right? Mm -hmm. Uh I'm changing the sounds. And then as this album, new album, Heathen, I'm thinking through and I'm like, I want to go back to square one. Why did I love music? Why did I fall in love with Jesus? And as you think through that, you think about these stories, like how we were sharing earlier. Sure. The heathen stories, like you missed church, you were called a heathen. That word yeah. heathen kept on popping up. And then I was like, I want to look up this word. Like, what is the true definition? So I do the whole looking up. I see like on, you just, if you Google it, first thing is like someone that's not held to a widely held religion, right? Uh, whether it's Christianity, whatever, any wow. religion, right? Wow. And then when you look at the Bible, I'm like, oh, it's nowhere in the Bible. And then I found out, oh, wait, it's, a new King, it's in King James Version, right? Sorry, really? I'm giving you all the nerdy stuff right now. I got it. I like it. That's so then, I asked. King James, I see that it's the only Bible version that it ever is used, right? Uh, all the other Bible versions, it says Gentiles. So I'm like, that's really interesting. 
And then I'm like, well, what is the context that heathen is being used? Uh, is it the same equivalence as Gentiles, right? And then I look at the Greek word as ethos, and I'm like, oh, this means ethnicity or someone that is non-Jewish, right? Then there's a few passages in the Bible where it talks about as someone as a sinner, right? Um, so I see three different things. I see one, ethnicity is part, it's connected with this uh, heathen. Then I see Gentiles is connected with heathen. And then I see a uh, sinner is connected with heathen. Mm. And I was like, man, that's all I've been trying to do is talk about culture, right? Talk about uh, the truth of the matter is we all are sinners, whether uh, we come to know Christ, it's not our identity, but uh, to this day, I'm still jacked up. You know, I am in desperate need of Jesus consistently every day. I need to seek him consistently every single day because I have human fleshly uh, desires at times, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so all these different points, I'm like, how do I impact the world with this message of heathen? Um, and then I, the team was like, I don't know, that's a scary word. And I was like, my mom always taught me this. Uh, normal, that word, it, it could be offensive. Like, you're not normal. But that word is not offensive. It's just saying something that's different, right? You're other, um, yeah, yeah. You're an other. And my mom always taught me, embrace that. If someone says, you're not normal, be like, thank you for realizing I'm not normal. Yes, exactly. Thank you for realizing I'm set apart. Right. Uh, and that's my message with this album. Uh, right. Whether somebody calls you a heathen or you feel like you're a heathen, right? You're doing heathen tendencies of whatever Christian culture is uh, telling you. I think the gospel is still uh, able to be reached with you. You are not too far from that message uh, of the great gospel. And I don't know why Christians are so scared of that word. It's really weird. Yeah. I think a lot of it is learned behavior, you know, and, and just stuff that we hear from pulpits the first 18, 20 years of our lives and just go, well, that, that must mean that then and okay. And yeah. I, I was, I was uh, m my story is that I was born to a white mom. Mm. At, she was 17 years old. She was white. She still is white, actually. Um, and my father was black. And okay, um, my parents, whole time. sorry, I thought you were Puerto Rican this whole time. Everybody thinks I am. I just, I just claim it, man. I'm married to a beautiful Puerto Rican. I just claim it. I sing in Spanish. So, you know, but um, my mother married my stepdad when I was a year old. So he was okay. white. And so I'm a black kid in a white family at three white siblings in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood and church. My dad pastored a predominantly Hispanic church. Okay. And so I found myself um, early in my life wanting to be in a box. Like mm -hmm. I, I, you know, when you're, when you're eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 and impressionable, the last thing you want to be is different. You, yeah. you, you know, my name was Israel. That was like, not a common name where I grew up. Um, I was the only black kid in our church. I was the only black kid in our town. I was the only black kid in my school. Yeah. And so I'm a black kid in a white family in a Hispanic church, and I'm just trying to fit in anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody had said, get in this box, there was a good chance I would get in that box and try and be comfortable in there. It was only, you know, once I started really finding my way and finding my voice, and music had a lot to do with that, like really, really getting into music, like my sophomore year in high school, and realizing what, you know, all of my heroes had in common musically was that they were different. They, they, mm. they were not cookie cutter at all. They did not fit into anybody's box. Yeah. And at that point, I really started to go, I could, I could hate the fact and lament the fact that I'm, I'm different than everybody else in my, in my world and circle, or I could celebrate that. Yeah. And, uh, and it, was, it wasn't until I really kind of made peace with that, mm. that, um, you know, I, if I fast forward a little bit, I, I got a, 
I got my first deal when I was 23 and wow. moved to Nashville for a while. And uh, I say for a while, I was probably there for five years. But um, in moving there, I would, I would meet with these Nashville experts, you know, no, no disrespect to them. I, I, I feel like they meant well and, and they knew what they knew. But I would sit with guys like on the CCM side and they'd say, you need to do a record that sounds like this. And I'm like, yeah, but I've got this other gear. Yeah, you know, and, and ultimately then I'd meet with like the gospel guys, the urban dudes, and they'd be like, it's got to be full on gospel only. And I'd be like, yeah, I hear you, but I don't know if I just do that because I've got this other gear. And so I would have people go, you're not black enough for gospel. You're not white enough for Christian music. And so you're kind of, you know, if, if, if you listen enough to that, you'll go, I'm an orphan. So somebody get me a box that I can fit into. Right. And I got to be honest with you, I wrestled with that in Nashville, especially in like 95, you know, was like that kind of, we've got this thing together. We're making a lot of money, and if you want to get involved, then you need to listen to the people that can help mold you into that. Wow. And the truth is, Carlos Santana changed my whole story, Ooh. period. Okay. So in 95, 96, he put out a record called Supernatural. Yeah. And Carlos Santana at that time was 50-something, Clive Davis. Mm. had worked with him years and years before and said, why don't we do a record on you that's like you featuring a bunch of different people in a bunch of different styles? And I remember going, there's no box for that, you know, because he would do like a Latin song, a rock song, a country song, a hip hop song, a pop song. He had the biggest song of the year that year, sold 14 or 15 million copies of that record and won, you know, every award that he was up for. And I went, why is the church and our, our industry so behind this concept. Like, here's, here's Santana, who by all accounts should just be a legacy artist at that point, and relying on his Woodstock, you know, era records. Instead, he puts out the biggest single of that year. Why? Because he, he refused to go, I don't want to age out and end up in a box and, and do, you know, yeah. My, my hits, so to speak, from 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. And I remember just really, really diving into the record, but more like the interviews and like where he was coming from. And I realized I don't have to be in a box. And honestly, in 95 is when I sat down and started writing the vision for pretty much everything I've checked off every box for the last 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And that is, I, I want to start a movement that is intentionally cross-cultural cross-generational and cross-denominational. What am I saying? I'm saying there is no box for that. That's you know, awesome. if I'm going to appeal, like you said, if I'm going to appeal to youth groups and my mom and, and churches and radio alike, you know, I'm going to have to dumb it down to this. And Santana proved you don't have to do that. And so I just right. really kind of followed his, his blueprint and, and, and allowed myself to be influenced by Every influence I ever had growing up, be it the Beatles, be it the Eagles, be it Andre Crouch, be it Keith Green, be it, you know, whoever it was and said this, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire, Michael Jackson, anything Quincy Jones and Stevie Wonder ever did, all sort of were these various tributaries that flowed into the river of my life. And that's what the music has been for the last 25 years. Oh, no, we hear it. Your Christmas album is still probably my favorite album. Oh man, Any Thank Christmas, you. Christmas album ever. Thank That's you, bro. Night. Boom, 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 boom. Oh my gosh! Oh, everything you do. I'm a real fan. Uh, Thank you, man. You said something really interesting, and I'm gonna ask you something right now that I've okay. been asked by followers. Okay. Um. Gabby, we hear you. Israel, we hear you. You're in a box. Get it. There's, there's culture, but if you just talk about Jesus, everything will just line up. Why do you have to be so concerned about culture? You know, why does it matter? Why does it matter, Israel? Um, why does affecting culture matter? Yeah. Why, well, why I mean, can't it just be about God all the time, Israel? 
Well, because something being about God all the time, and, and I, I do believe that there is a foundation of a message with which we share everything. So technically it is about God all the time because that's, that's, that's the force that woke me up this morning. That's right. the force that gave me the vision that I had. That's the force that put the word heathen in your mind and said, right. go tackle this. So right. ultimately everything is about God. I, I feel like there are two types of people in the world, Gabby, people that wake up in the morning looking to inspire. Mm. And there are other people that wake up in the morning looking to either start or join a fight. There are people that wake that woke up this morning, went to their Instagram just to look for something to argue about. Man. I don't understand that. I've never understood that. I never will. But yeah, okay. And there are other people that are looking, looking and needing inspiration, looking to give inspiration, looking to receive it. Yeah. Why is culture important? Because I mean, as we're discovering right now, uh, when when you say why can't it just be about God and Jesus? Well, un unfortunately, when we say, why can't something just be about God and Jesus? Most of the time we're talking about two things together. Evangelization, prosel you know, proselytize proselytizing, or like elitism. It's us mm. against the world, the church, and we're in our safe four walls, and we know the language, yeah. and we speak yeah. fluent Christianese, and we know the secret handshake, and yeah. we, you know... And, and so there's, I've never been a part of either. I've, I've always felt like sure. man, there is a way to be effective um, sure. and share the gospel. What did St. Francis of Assisi say? Preach the gospel everywhere and if necessary, use words. Mm. So the whole idea is my life can be a light. The example of how I conduct myself, how I carry myself around my kids, how I carry myself around my wife, how I carry myself around others, how I treat a waiter, how I treat an Uber driver. You know, that, that is me shining a particular light. So, yes, it is all about Jesus ultimately. But, but what we're discovering right now is ain't nobody gathering in churches anymore. And I don't know how long that's going to be. So the idea of, like, come to my church and come hear the real truth, that's not really going to fly right now. Right. And, and me getting on social media and espousing what I believe and what I think and why you're wrong and why I'm right is also tremendously tone deaf and ineffective. Yeah. So how do I touch culture by going, hey, there's hope. There's hope in Jesus. And let me give you examples of that. Yeah. Great. But, but let's just talk about living. Let's just talk about being a good human being, especially in a time where the world needs that more than anything. So you got to understand, like I went through a, a pretty public crash in my life mm. four and a half years ago I made a couple statements about it hey I got divorced I I, I felt like you know I, I, I wasn't good at that marriage mm -hmm. and I had a lot of people um, really really disappointed in the fact that I was a human being all of a sudden and yeah. they had to relate to my humanity rather than some sort of false deity that they had set up in, in my name and yeah. the craziest thing happened, right? I saw a calendar that was full for about two and a half years within about two and a half weeks become completely empty. I saw all of that, you know, potential money, all of those potential deals gone, just gone. And at that point I had to go, well, what do I believe? That's, that was the first big, like, do I believe what I've been singing about all this time or has it been a, uh, uh, an economic play, you know? Yeah. The other thing that happened though, is I found myself because of my, my relationship with Adrian and our marriage, I found myself in, in a completely different set of green rooms than you were talking about. Yeah. I found myself in green rooms at the Emmys and the Grammys and the Oscars and, you know, and award yeah. shows and, and, yeah. you know, big, big, you know, mainstream type stuff. And I found myself running into people that were heroes of mine who mm. would come up to me and go, you have no idea what your music has done for me. And I'm like, huh? Like uh. I had no idea. And, and inevitably these people go, well, you're a man of God, right? They're not sitting there going, yeah, but you're not at your church anymore or you're not, you know, on the circuit anymore. So I, I'm not going to talk to you. 
heathens sought me out, said, yeah. hey, man, could you pray for me for this? Could you pray for me for that? And, what, and that was cool. What was even cooler was just having regular conversations with somebody. For and sure. I don't know if this is going to upset anybody or not, but like regular conversations with a glass of wine in my hand. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. But it was effective, like tremendously yeah. effective. Yeah. And I'm sitting there talking to guys about life and real estate and investment and family and relationships yeah. and music and whatever. And very rarely was it uh, worship conversations or, or, you know, church conversations. A lot of it was life, but they walk away going, well, let me get your number. Let me holler at you again. And then come the faith conversations. Yeah. And then come the prayers. And then come the watering of the seeds you planted by yeah. just being a human being and being present in the moment and honoring people for where, for where they are and who they are. Yeah. Bro, with, with what's going on right now, right? You yep. said it, church, uh, church is just different now, right? There is no church gathering at all. No. Um, so if you miss church, you're not a heathen anymore. <laughs> <just saying. laughs> I'm curious, what's your take on this? Like, whether some believers like it or not, and I don't think this is all believers. I just think this is probably like a loud 5%, you know what I'm saying? But whether it's, uh, you believe this or not, there is a culture in Christianity, right? Whether you grew up black, whether you grew up white, Latino, there's just a church culture that uh, is invented, right? Which I think is a beautiful thing, right? Right. Um, I don't ever want that to go away. I think it was such a safe, like black, black history in America. I was such a safe place for a black church to be for in. For sure. You know? For sure, for uh, sure. Latinos that don't even speak any English found a safe haven in a Hispanic church, right? Sure. Um, so I, I think culture is very important. Um, but right now, church looks really different and this is about to probably go to i don't know more months right that's what they're saying what, yeah what do you think is going to be the new norm for church believers is this going to shift everything too do you think uh after yeah. like say this all gets you know we fix it we put a bandage on this whole corona thing and it's fixed we're able to go gather now is there going to be a new walk well, okay, so I uh, yeah, Absolutely. there's layers. The simple to the answer question. is there's layers. there's layers to it, but absolutely, yeah. it's going to be a different thing because one, people are now developing a new uh, way of connecting with God and connecting with other people. For sure, and and I think for the last, you know, let's say twenty, thirty years, we've put so much focus on. Um the contemporary side of let's, let's, let's be the cool place to hang out. Let's have it look good, sound good. You know, yeah. let's have our presentation be bomb. Yeah. And a lot of times that presentation was at the expense of the presence. Mm. And so we can have great presentation and great, what I would call icing, but the cake was terrible. Cake was dry. Cake had no flavor. Yeah. Icing looked bomb. Yeah. But you bite into it and it's like, this is terrible. Right. And I realized that so much of what we did in building businesses that we called church and, and, and which should, by definition, put us in the people business, really wasn't about people at all. And now, mm. now everything is about people. Now it's like, who can I reach out to? Who can I be effective to? Who can I reach out to for my own? help who can i help yeah. but who can help me and and i think this new habit that's being created of zoom chats like this and zoom church and internet church i'm telling yeah. you man it, it, now what's coming into total necessity is what is your message and if mm -hmm. your message is a copy of somebody else's message and if your message is an echo of somebody else's thing you're going to find yourself tremendously empty handed when, when this thing lifts. Um, yeah. So in the meantime, 
the beauty I'm finding is everybody who really, really takes this seriously is finding a place with God that they've maybe never been in or, yeah. or it was those early stages where all of us were, had so much zeal and excitement for the presence of God that we would inconvenience ourselves and anyone else to be with Jesus. Mm. And now it's like all those blessings we asked him for, all of those things that he's poured out to us, they don't get to compete with him anymore. Mm. Now he has our full attention. Yeah. And so what is it going to mean going back to church? Man, that is probably the million dollar question that every pastor I know and talk to almost every day is asking mm. themselves. So yeah. they're trying to be effective now. And it's, it's, I, Again, I keep saying I like the idea that it's resetting us to get yeah. back to something sin sincere and real and yeah. authentic. And yeah. anything beyond that is 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 going to look foolish and, and have a kind of an immediate expiration date on it. For sure. I think there's been a huge transition. Uh, let, let's let's put a number like say in the past five years. There's been a huge trans, uh, transition that I've seen in churches that has been really dope for me. One, I think it's a lot to do with the internet. People mm -hmm. don't believe everything anymore. So it's like, I'm going to Google that on my own. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, it's, it's like bittersweet. Um, where I just love that there's a new generation, right, that I speak to a lot of college students. I speak to a lot of high schoolers because that's what all my shows are basically are. They're just trying to figure out what is church culture looking like now for them. And it's that journey. Everyone has it. We all have that journey of like, I want this faith to become my own now. I remember when I was in high school, uh, I grew, so my dad was a pastor. I grew up in yeah. high school uh, at a different church than my father's. And uh, that's where I actually had faith become my own when I actually left my own church that I grew up in, right? Mm. Uh, for the longest, I was just like, it's a tradition. I already know the routine. I can tell you all the Bible verses you want to hear. So you give me a pat on the back and we're good. Sure. Uh, but I'm realizing there's a different, um, there's a different era now. Uh, even the way pastors are doing stuff. Like I love uh, just off top, Mike Todd. I, I say his name because I was seeing his IG live last night. He had a million, which is dope. Um, but I love love how he's approaching church. I love how Rich is approaching church. Uh, mm -hmm. These are very different times now compared to 10 years ago. Sure. Um, and I'm just, I'm in that same bubble where I'm trying to figure out as things are transitioning, is it for the best or is it for the worst? Which is scary because um, we're always trying to figure out how do we impact the world with uh, God's word? And God's word is always going to be enough, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's nothing, it's years and years, nothing has stopped this word. <laughs> but I'm, as a creative, this is what bothers me a lot. As a creative, because I love inspiring people, I love creativity, just something new. I'm always trying to figure out how do I push the envelope what's next what whether it's zoom zoom with churches all right that's what's that's what we are now um or even sonically musically the way you were saying I, that's i really felt inspired when you said that because i never heard you say this before as far as how you were talking about i wasn't too gospel but mm -hmm. i wasn't young um just living out the right path that you just felt called to what's true to you and I think my ultimate goal with this album, Heathen, is, man, things are going to look really different for a lot of people, whether it's culturally, uh, whether it's your life patterns, right? There's going to be a lot of different things that's going to happen. But ultimately, I just hope um, we are inspired to continue to push the gospel, not mimicking others. Right. No, it's, I, you know what I see? I see you in a big bulldozer of some kind and, and you're, you might be near the highway, right off the highway, but you're mm. building completely different road. And a lot of times that means knocking down brush and trees and obstacles the way 
yeah. to create the the path that you're creating. And I feel like for years that's what New Breed did. That's 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 what we set out to do because we had a lot of people go, "Wait, you guys, you guys are black? You could, wait, you guys are white? You know, wait, you guys are, you know, wait, you play guitar? What do you what is this?" And so there was a lot of people that was like they mm-hmm. didn't get it. I mean, one of my heroes in music was like a record like that's not going to work. I sent him the song so excited for him to hear him. And he's like, yeah, man, it's not really going to work. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to bet on myself then, you know, and, and to, and to eclipse the sales of my hero on my first record was like shocking. And, you know, years later he came back around and was like, yo man, you, you did your thing. And I was like, I had to do what was authentic to me. It's like, I could put on Saul's armor, but yeah. I'm not going to take no giants out with it. You know, I mm. need to go with what comes authentic to me. And, yeah. um, and so a lot of it was getting in a bulldozer, so to speak, and just mm. digging trails across the world that other people were either, I, you know, ignoring or just didn't know that they could exist. I have a question. This might be one of my last questions, too. Um, I thought I came to peace with all of this when I did my second album because I was like, oh, I've seen enough. Yeah. I'm going to release this music. I feel good to, about it. It's different. But I realized in making this album, I still haven't come to peace about certain things, right? Like, Just like what? Like, like Christian culture or uh, why is gospel all black and why is CCM all white for the most part? Yeah. Um, why does nobody talk about this? Like a lot of questions I have just about culture, but then it's like my, my part that I wrestle as me as a human being, I'm like, this is stuff that you're seeing, Gabby. Um, your fans aren't seeing uh, all the behind the scenes stuff. Does it matter? And I'm like, I wrestle. I'm like, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe I just keep my lane and just continue doing good worship music. But then it's like, my mom has always taught me stand up for stuff that you see is wrong. Or if you have curiosity, find an answer and, and find peace in it. Um, and there's just certain things that I'm just like, I want to innovate. I want to start new. But I guess I haven't hit my peace about where I'm at in life. And it seems like you've found peace of where you're at in life as a whole, uh, as a man, a music uh, your your faith, and I'm just curious: is there a, a secret ingredient, or is this a consistent journey of just? And I I, I don't want it to become like I don't want the Christian answer. I would just really no. I got you. I got you. I I I, I I'll keep it real. I have nothing to lose. Yeah. Uh, I always wanted to be the Jonathan. I never wanted to be the David. Mm. I always wanted to support the David. I never wanted mm. to be out front. I was a drummer first. I liked. I liked kind of being behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for whatever reason, the, the stage kept turning and I kept finding myself going from behind to, to out front. And, I agree. you know, I, I don't, uh, I, I, part of my piece is early on, I just, I think that's why I gravitated to worship so much because the true mark of a worship leader the purest mark of a worship leader Mm -hmm. is to be looked through, not to be looked at. And so that came into crazy conflict within itself though, when you start signing record deals and publishing deals and developing Mm -hmm. artists and producing other stuff, because it's like, well, now there's an economic um, responsibility. There is a branding responsibility. So as much as I'd love to be invisible and looked through, um, there is a, there is a element to this of being looked at as well. And, mm. you know, anybody who's worked with me for the last 25 years could tell you that's never come easy to me. I've never been a good self promoter. I can promote other people like crazy, love to promote yeah. other people. Yeah. You know, my last record, they're like, you got to be on Instagram three times a day. you got to post all this stuff. And I was like, man, I tried it. I, I <laughs> promise you, I tried it. My my wife was my social media manager and she's brilliant with social media, but I just freaking hated it. Like hated it. It wasn't that I didn't want to encourage people cause I live for that, but 
the idea of like, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me never worked for me. Mm -hmm. And so you say you, you feel like I've found the formula of being, you know, at peace with it. I, you know, it's still a wrestle every day because on the one hand, I've got a lot of people who have followed us for a long time going, please release more music. Please do more lives at home. Please sing more. Please join the, the sound that everybody else is making right now. And there's a part of me that just goes, uh, I, I, yeah, if I feel it, I will, you know, and I, it's not me. That's not me being facetious at all. It's really like, you know, I, I, I spent 22 years on that treadmill. Hmm. And though we won a bunch of awards and sold a bunch of records and did a bunch of tours and stuff, um, I, I, I wasn't at peace within myself. And as a result, a lot of things in my life changed drastically. Hmm. So the idea of getting back on that treadmill, so to speak, does yeah. not appeal to me at all because I actually really like my life. I love being married. I, I'm enjoying, like I told you, I'm enjoying this quarantine so much because I'm already a homebody anyway. So hmm. the idea of never having to leave is, is yeah. wildly appealing to me. Yeah. Um, so I, yes, I have made peace with that. And at the same time, there is this ever living call and cause on the inside of people like you and on, in the inside of people like me that mm -hmm. can't help but feel something for the world that we're living in, certainly currently, mm -hmm. and that, that wants to, you know, that wakes up every day going, God, make me an answer to somebody's prayer today. Whatever that is, make me an answer. And, right. and so that is my prayer. And that does bring about its own conflict because I'd love to just chill here and, you know, and be done. But yeah. there is, you know, there's more to it. I would encourage you in all of that because I get the struggle and I get the wrestle. Um, I think balance is everything. I think anybody I've known that's ever been successful, mm. their biggest Achilles heel has been finding the balance between, you know, being present at home and being yeah. effective abroad. And um, that is, that is not easy. It, it's not easy for anybody. And there are a lot of people that are almost applauded for, for choosing the career over their family or choosing ministry over, over, you know, yeah. fidelity at home. And I've experienced both sides of that. And I'm really enjoying um, being in a place of balance right now. I meet a lot of people that are burned out, but they're, they're like, kind of to your point, they're not satisfied with where they are yeah. and they know that there's more. And it's a question of navigating how to, how to be effective in, in going for the more yeah. and still be at peace within yourself. Yeah, man. I really hope we can continue conversations like this. I love just picking out your Anytime. Question. I dig talking to you, man. For real. I know. I remember the first time when we did the FaceTime, I felt such like a nerd because I had the fanboy moment. <laughs> Oh, that's crazy, but now, man. now I feel very comfortable and I just really appreciate you. I thank you a lot again for being on my album. Yeah, um, it's an honor, man. Words can't describe how much you mean to me, bro. So thank you again for this. It means a lot. And I hope this message uh, really inspires people and communicates really good for a lot of fans on both of our ends. Yes, sir, man. All right, bro. Well, I felt good about this. Good. Likewise. Everybody go get heathen now. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bro. I'm going to leave this chat now. All right. God bless. Man, take care.